Well, good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning at Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Westbridge. I want to say hello to the, all of you who are engaging with us online. Thank you for participating with us uh, through that avenue. And uh, man, this is really fun because uh, not only are we dedicating kids, but we're talking about parenting today. And we have uh, been in a series over the last few weeks called Nobody Told Me. Uh, before we jump into that, I want to let you know that Easter is only a few weeks away. It's about six weeks away from Easter. And so uh, on Easter, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be um, adding some service times. We want to make sure that you have the opportunity to invite friends to Easter Sunday. And since Easter is an invitation that a lot of people uh, potentially will say yes to, we want to make sure that we have plenty of space. And so with that in mind, we're going to be doing five Easter services. We're going to be doing two on Saturday night and three on Sunday morning on Easter weekend. Now, here's where we need your help because we know there's going to be a lot of kids here that week. And uh, we want to make sure that we have places available for them. So today on your connection card, if you would be interested in saying, you know what, I could help out during one of those services, I could serve in kids. And so that would mean like, hey, we, I'll, I'll serve at one service and I'll attend a different Easter service. And it doesn't mean you're signing up for the kids team permanently. It just means you'd be willing to help us out on Easter weekend for a one-time serve so that we can make sure that we have enough places for all of our kids to go. And if you'd be willing to do that, would you just write Easter kids on the back of your connection card and drop that off on your way out today and just let us know, hey, I'd be willing to help out during one of the Easter services and our uh, kids team We'll get in touch with you and make sure that uh, we get you signed up somewhere. So if you'd be willing to do that, we could sure use the help that weekend. We want to make sure our community knows how much we love and value their kids, their teenagers, and uh, we want to make sure that we're ready for them. So thanks for considering that. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been doing this series called Nobody Told Me. And we started week one, Nobody Told Me Marriage is Difficult. And the second week, we said, nobody told me dating is treacherous. Last week, nobody told me sex is complicated. And so if you missed any of those, I want to encourage you to go check that out. Today, nobody told me parenting is impossible. It's impossible. Uh, maybe six weeks ago, a couple of months ago, we were hanging out uh, at home. And uh, my two boys, who are 12 and 6, were making a smoothie. And uh, you can imagine how that went, a 12 and 6-year-old making a smoothie. It actually went pretty well. And they poured it out and they were getting ready. And my 6-year-old takes a drink and uh, he used a word I've never heard him use quite in that context before. He, he said the, uh, the S word, but totally in context. Okay, so I'll use the word ship to make it a little more palatable here. But he took a drink and he put it down and he goes, holy ship, that's good. <laughs> and we all just kind of looked at each other like, did, did he just say what I thought he just said? And I looked at my wife and we looked at each other and then we all burst out laughing, first of all. And then that's when I knew he's been spending too much time with his mom. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? <laughs> Parenting is impossible. It's so, there's so many things that are unexpected. And so we had to be like, where would you hear that? You know, and uh, yeah, you used it in context, but you know, there's settings where we don't want to use that, right? So I follow uh, an account on Twitter called Sarcastic Mom. Uh, if you don't follow her, you should. She puts out some hilarious stuff. Here's a couple of her tweets. She says, sometimes my kids are so cute that it literally hurts my heart just to look at them. Other times they're awake. <laughs> Here's another one. New neighbors moved in across the street and offered to host a play date. For all I know, they might be axe murderers. But for three hours of peace and quiet, I'm willing to risk it. <laughs> and then this one's my favorite. I walked by a kid and a mom standing in front of a pizza place, and I overheard the mom say, screw it, let's have pizza. I won't bore you with the details, but she's now my life coach. <laughs> I love it. So my wife and I have four kids. Kaylee is 17, almost 18. Chloe is 14. Layton's 12. Liam is 6. And uh, I'll tell you, I used to be an expert on parenting before I had kids. 
I knew it all before I had kids, okay? So this series is for everybody. Uh, Even if you don't have kids, you interact with kids on some level somewhere along the way. Maybe you're planning to have kids. Uh, Maybe uh, you have grandkids, uh, nieces and nephews. I also want you to know while we're going to learn some principles uh, from the scriptures today that uh, are going to be helpful, you don't have to be a follower of Jesus to put some of these things into practice. So you can decide how much of this you want to put into practice in your own life and in your own family. I also realize that for some, Talking about parenting surfaces some real emotions because you've experienced loss in this area of your life. And some of you have experienced miscarriages. Some of you have, have lost a child. And I can't even imagine the pain of that. Uh, and maybe some of you are trying to have children and you haven't been able to have kids yet. And I don't want to downplay your sorrow. I cannot possibly imagine the pain of losing a child. Uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Our goal today is not to rub your nose in the blessings of others, but at the same time, we want to take what we can from the scriptures and apply it to our lives, and we grieve with those who grieve, and we celebrate with those who celebrate. And so today, I want you to know, parenting is one of the most difficult jobs on the planet. And we're in a stage of preschool, or a stage of parenting that goes from first grade to 12th grade. So we've got 12th grade, 9th grade, 7th grade, and 1st grade. And uh, I'm telling you, at this point, there is not a week that goes by where someone in our house doesn't try to run away. I promise I've come back every time so far. And there's enough dysfunction in any family to uh, make you feel frustrated, to make you feel like you're a failure. But I promise you, I want to let you know, you are not alone. Okay? And so part of the reason parenting is so difficult is that it's always... It always feels like you're chasing your kids into that next season of life, right? And so as soon as you're like, okay, I got this season figured out, all of a sudden it changes. Now you're in a new season. And so you're constantly playing catch up as a parent. Another reason is that every single kid is so vastly different. It's astonishing, isn't it? With four kids for us, I look around the dinner table and I can't believe that these four human beings came from the same DNA pool. It's unbelievable because of how different they are from each other. And some of that's just from birth, you know. It's like some kids come out of the womb with a rose in their mouth, and they're like, I love the world. And other kids come out with a cigar in their mouth, right? And they're like, hey, the next few years are going to be tough on all of us. (laughs) It's just DNA, man. And so... Every generation has new challenges. That's a whole nother thing, right? I know my generation had to deal with pinning your pants and the whole scandal of Millie Vanilli. And my kids are facing a whole different set of challenges. And so while the, fe- the pressure is to be great parents, it's a moving target. And I, I love this conversation from uh, Lewis Carroll's book, Alice in Wonderland, between Alice and the Cheshire Cat. Now, Alice says, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go? And the the cat responds, that depends on where you want to get to. And she says, I don't much care where. And he responds, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And there's actually some brilliance in that conversation. If you don't know what you're trying to accomplish with parenting, then it can just really feel like a moving target. And it can really feel like you don't really know where to go or what to do. And so our goal today isn't to tell you, here's all the stuff you need to know about parenting. Rather, I want to give you some simple principles that I think can help you as you navigate parenting, some things to shoot for in the lives of your kids to uh, have influence in their lives. So here's two observations about parenting. I I encourage you to write this down. Your top priority as a parent is to retain influence. That's it. That is your number one goal as a parent is to retain influence in the life of your kids. As your children get older and older, as they grow up and the control that you're able to exert over them becomes less and less. The, the amount of authority that you have and the amount of control that you have in their life becomes less and less. And it doesn't even remain a top priority to try to retain control because when they're younger, you have control. You can pick them up. You can carry them around. You put them in the car seat, right? When they get older, they can pick you up. <laughs> they can put you in a car seat. And... You no longer have control. At that point, your goal is to retain influence. And here's why that's so important. Because the older that kids get, the more critical our influence becomes in their life. They don't need as much influence when you're trying to tell them to uh, brush their teeth every day. You're trying to exert control in that situation. But there's, there's weightier consequences as our kids get older. And as our kids grow up, the weight of the consequences of their decisions 
becomes greater, and they need our influence in their life to a greater degree. And the times in our life when they actually need our influence the most is when the consequences of their decisions carry the most weight. For example, they need our influence when they're choosing who and how to date. There's a lot of weight to the consequences of that decision. They need our influence when they're trying to figure out sexuality and how they're going to handle their sex life. They need our influence when they're choosing a career path. They need our influence when they're choosing who to marry. They need our influence when they're dealing with issues uh, around ethics and integrity what kind of person they're going to be. They need our influence when they're dealing with decisions about how to handle themselves. And so what we must consider as parents is that compliance is not the same as influence. You might be able to get them to do what you want them to do, but that's not the same as influence, right? At what cost? How much influence do you lose in the process when you try to exert control? Because at the end of the day, what you want is influence. And here's what the Apostle Paul writes, and he's writing to uh, all kinds of different relationships. And he, in um, Ephesians 5, he's just written to husbands and wives, and then he writes to kids. He says, children, obey your parents. That's a good one. That's a good memory verse. And then he says this then to parents. Parents, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. It's possible that you can exert control in the life of your kids to the point where they comply with your wishes, they actually comply with your demands, but you lose influence in the process. Think about that. They, they did exactly what you asked them to do, but they can't wait to move out. And you can actually be right as a parent, and it's possible to be right and let them know you're right, and you can write them right out the door. Because you lost influence because you tried to exert control. And at the end of the day, that is not what you want. And so you, you have to ask yourself, how much is momentary compliance worth? How much influence is it going to cost me? Is the battle worth it or is there a better way? And so you have to know your number one goal is to retain influence. Now, in order for us to understand how influence works in the lives of our kids, it's critical that we understand what stage of life our kids are in. And so there's a reason that my 17-year-old drives a car and my 6-year-old doesn't. It's not fair. <laughs> right, but there's a reason for that. And I've, I gave up being fair with my kids a long time ago. I'm not even trying to be fair. I'm not treating them fairly. I love them equally, but I do not treat them fairly because they're different. I don't treat them the same. My goal isn't to be the fairest parent in the land. My, my goal is to prepare them for life. And that requires different parenting for different personalities, different kids, and particularly in different phases of life. So let's walk through this together. That first phase of life is the nurse. In other words, you're feeding them and keeping them alive. And that's it. Right? And here's what you'll notice. In this stage, authority and friendship, pretty low. And what I mean by that is, uh, yeah, you have lots of authority, but it's not like you're telling your kids when they're an infant, hey, you need to go brush your teeth. And they're like, okay. Uh, you're not telling them, hey, come in. Like, you're basically just feeding them and keeping them alive. And this is a relatively short season of life, Right? Like, they get to a stage when they're, what, two, three years old where they're starting to, you can start to have actual conversations a little bit and talk through some things. But even then, your friendship is slowly building, but it's not like you guys are buddy, buddy, buddy until they get to be two, three years old. It's why, typically speaking, moms love babies and dads are like, eh. I mean, they don't do much. And dads, we connect when in this friendship stage. But here's what happens. You move from the nurse stage into the king-queen stage. Okay? And here's what you need to know. Mom and dad, during this stage, authority, authority goes way up. Okay? Friendship, a little bit. Authority has to go up in the king-queen stage. This is a monarchy. Your kids need to know that. And here's why. Because they are constantly trying to usurp the throne. They're, they live in a state of rebellion, okay, trying to overthrow the kingdom because they're little sinners. <laughs> These people that you've created want to overthrow the kingdom, all right? You've got to fight to stay in charge during these years. And that's just the reality, okay? And I've heard this before from parents be like, well, I read somewhere in a psychology book, you should never, ever say no to your kids. Can I tell you something? 
that's just stupid. <laughs> that's just stupid. Of course you say no to your kids. The, you are in charge. You have the authority and you need to exert authority because you need to let them know, here's the boundaries. Here's, here's what it looks like to live as a part of our household. And so in this season, here's what happens. Authority goes way, way up. Friendship starts to build a little bit. And here's what I've seen is sometimes parents in this phase, they want to be liked and they don't want to say no. They don't want to be disliked by their kids. And so what happens is they actually abdicate the throne and they actually let the kids do whatever the kids want to do because they want to be liked in that season. But your goal in this season is not to be liked. In fact, you might be unliked for a while. That's okay. They'll like you later. But here's the truth. You've got to set boundaries when they're in, these, in this stage. This stage, uh, if we were given it age range, right, is probably 3 to 12. This is probably 0 to 3. And then something happens when you get into this next phase. You get into this coaching phase. And in the coaching phase... This starts to go way down, and the friendship starts to go up. And something happens somewhere between the ages of 12 to 15, you know, up, up to the time that they're 18 years old. Something starts to happen where your authority actually starts to go down, but your friendship starts to go up. And you start to relinquish some of the control that you have, and instead you start to lean into influence. And that's really, really critical during that season because then you enter into this friendship phase and it's all friendship. And your authority in their life disappears. You're no longer in charge of anything. They can make all of their own decisions and they get to live with all of the consequences of all of their own decisions. But you get to be there as a friend. And if you navigate these stages properly, and if you navigate them well, what happens is you retain that friendship and relationship and influence into their life long after, long after uh, you've lost control. So when you move into those coaching stages, that's, that's you kind of watching from the sideline, shouting encouragement, and they're actually on the field of play, and they might even call an audible but then you guys can review the film after the game and say, man, you, you should have done this differently. You should have done that differently. This is critical during the season that your authority goes down and that your friendship and relationship goes up. And then you get to this last phase. And this is really self-explanatory, isn't it? I mean, isn't this what we all want? We want to have friendship that lasts. And one of the biggest goals that my wife and I have is that when our kids move out, when they turn 18 and they become adults and they move out of our house, that they will want to be with us even when they don't have to be with us. That they will want to be around our family. Now, here's where this gets really tricky, where I've seen parents get in trouble. They don't assert authority in the king, uh, queen stage. And then what happens is their kids start to make some decisions in the coaching phase and then mom and dad suddenly try to use a lot of authority to help their kids. And all that does is exactly what Paul wrote not to do. Don't exasperate your kids. Don't provoke them to anger by the way that you parent them, but rather bring them up. And suddenly they get into the coaching years and they realize I should have used more authority during the king-queen stage. And so now I'm going to lean into authority really hard when really what my, key, what my kids need is a, a coach and encouragement and relationship. And you can actually lose influence and erode influence by the way that you treat your kids during the coaching years. And if you abdicate during that king-queen season where you need authority. And so here's the second thing. The quality of your friendship determines your influence. The quality of your relationship is what determines your influence. What happens to those of us who are parents is that as our kids get older, we try to continue to influence them using our authority instead of our friendship. And that's the irony is that if we don't make the shift from authority to friendship and relationship, we actually lose influence, which is the one thing that we want. And at a certain point in adolescence, your kids have become very familiar with your worldview. They've become very familiar with your opinions. And they don't need your advice as much as they need you to listen with them as they process. They know how you see the world. They're 15. They know how you see the world. And they, they believe that they know everything at 15. But they've, they've, 
caught enough from you and your worldview and how you see the world and how you treat people. They, they, at that point, what you want to do is retain influence. And it's not by giving them all the answers or fixing all their problems. That's what authority does. It's coaching them. The way that you retain influence is by maintaining a good relationship with them because the quality of your relationship will always determine the weight of your influence. Now, here's the tension, right? Uh, early childhood, it's based on that authority. It's based on control. It's based on you doing what you told them to do. And it's centered on protection. You have to do that because you have to protect them from certain things. You have to keep them alive long enough to be able to coach them. And then as they grow, parenting is based on relationship, which is mostly centered on influence. And if you don't make that shift, you'll exasperate your kids and lose influence. But here's the question. Don't they still need discipline? You can't just get to the coaching years and let, let go, right? Of course not. You, you can let them do what they want to do. And here's the answer. Yes, they absolutely need discipline. And the way that you discipline kids, especially as you get into the coaching years, is that you side with your kids against their consequences. You just side with them against their consequences. In other words, here's what discipline looks like. It's, it's found in these two words. Oh, no. That's it. Oh, no. I am so bummed that you have to pay that speeding ticket. Man, I'm so sorry. That, that is a bummer. Oh, no. Oh, I am so bummed that you did poorly on that test and you have to retake it. I'm so sorry. That, is a, that, that really sucks. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I'm bummed. You're not going to be able to go to that party because, you know, you already made a commitment to finish your chores and you never finished your chores and so you can't go to the party. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> oh, no. It is 30 minutes past your curfew and we agreed ahead of time that if you were late for curfew, this would be the consequence. Oh, man, that sucks for you. I'm so sorry. I'm not mad at you. I'm not even punishing you. I I'm just telling you, these are just the natural consequences of your decisions. And I'm bummed that you have to deal with that and that you have to experience that. But I'm for you and I'm not against you. I'm siding with you against those things that will ultimately harm you. Any discipline should ultimately be restorative, not retributive. It's always rooted in reestablishing broken relationship, not punishing someone. And so this is exactly what God did with us. The cross of Jesus is God reestablishing broken relationship with us in spite of our sin. Any good parental discipline says, oh no, you are going to face consequences, but I'm going to be right here with you. It, it's a bummer that you have to go through that, but it isn't about punishing them. It's about helping them learn. It's about bringing them up, Paul says. If we can understand these seasons of parenting these phases of development in the lives of our kids, then we can retain influence in their life later. And can I tell you something? And I'd encourage you to write this down. Later is longer. Later is longer. Your discipline and training and coaching is about 14 to 15 years. That's it, right? And you get to hopefully enjoy relationship with your kids 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There's a few years in each of these seasons, but the last season, that's potentially a few decades. That's where you want influence, because later is longer. So, in the few minutes we have together, I want to give you four areas that you should really focus on bringing influence into the lives of your kids. The first one is this, ongoing friendship with our family. Ongoing friendship with our family. Remember, later, longer is later. So in the heat of the moment, during these seasons of parenting, we have to keep in mind, here's what we want at the end of all of this. Here's what we want in the longer stage, right? We want them to want to be around us. We want them to want to bring the grandkids over. We want to maintain friendship with our kids when they become adults. And that means you have to take the long view when it comes to parenting. And sometimes parenting isn't about what's best for them right now as much as it's about what's best for them long term. So how do we maintain that relationship in such a way that it's intact when they're older? Because right now, I just want to scream at you because it makes me feel better. But that doesn't help us have a friendship later. Right now, I just want to send you to your room for the week because it makes me feel better. But that doesn't help us have a friendship later. Right now, I just want to send you to boarding school in London. <laughs> that will make me feel better. But that doesn't help us have friendship later on. It simply doesn't happen by accident. It requires for us to have 
Friendship, influence, relationship, long into their adult life, it requires us to pull out of the moments where we're frustrated and remember the end result that we're shooting for with our kids. And we can do that. It helps us move from being reactive to being proactive. From simply reacting in the moment to actually thinking long term about what's best for our kids. The Apostle Paul writes this in Romans. He says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. Our goal as our kids become adults is that we would live in harmony with them well into adulthood because that is a picture of how our Heavenly Father deals with us. And that's how we want to treat our kids. And the way that Jesus deals with us is not by punishing us, to appease some type of anger that he feels. Rather, he gently guides us for our benefit, not his. He guides us towards those things that are healthy for us, that are best for us. And so this is an example that we're to follow when it comes to our kids as well. That we would do everything that we can to uh, spend time with them and have ongoing friendship with our family. Here's the second thing. Security in their own identity. We want our kids, by the time they leave our house, to know exactly who they are, to know whose they are, to know that they belong to God. And every single one of us has some kind of picture in our mind of what we want our family to look like. And it's based on all kinds of different factors, ranging from what we grew up with, the roles our parents played, uh, TV shows we've seen, movies that we've seen, uh, things we've read. All of these are factors in our sort of family construct that we envision. But as soon as you have kids, can I tell you something? That picture gets blown out of the water. That's just the reality. Over the years, I've had to change uh, the tone of parenting talks. When I first started doing parenting talks, I didn't have any kids, so I thought I understood what parenting was like. First parenting series was like, 10 principles for raising amazing kids. Like, wow, that sounds really good, right? And then, and then I had my first kid, and then I was like, seven suggestions <laughs> for raising okay kids. And then I had a second kid, and I was like, five ideas that may or may not help. <laughs> and now I'm like, here's three tips for survival, you know, like. <laughs> because whatever construct you have of what your family is going to look like, it's not going to look like that. I promise you it's going to get blown out of the water. But one of the greatest gifts we can give to our children is to help them feel secure in their identity, in who they are. Feel secure in who God created them to be. Help them know you don't have to compare yourself to anybody else. You don't have to compare yourself to any other family, to any other kid, to any other person. God created you to be exactly who God created you to be. And my role as a parent is to keep you alive long enough so that I can start to coach you, so that I can continually reinforce this idea to help you become the you that God made you. That's one of the greatest gifts you can give your kids. In Ephesians 2, Paul writes this, We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. It means you can address behavior even as you affirm their identity. One of the best ways to do this when you're disciplining your kids is to say, look, this is what you've done, but this is who you are. We do this all the time, especially when our kids are younger. Hey, is this, is this how Jesus would behave? No. You want to be someone who follows Jesus. Yeah, I do. Well, then this behavior, that's not who you are. This thing that you just did, that isn't who God created you to be. Why don't you keep being you? And don't do this. And you can discipline and you can, you can address behavior even as you affirm identity. And one of the greatest messages we can communicate to our kids is that we care more about who they're becoming than what they accomplish. And this can be difficult for some parents because you always wanted your son or daughter to follow in your footsteps. But you have to let go of that because who they're becoming is more important than what they accomplish. And when you look at your family, my guess is it looks different than you imagined it would. Nobody told you your kids would get sick. Nobody told you your son's not going to be an athlete like you. Uh, nobody told you that uh, your daughter might have a learning disability. N nobody told you it would be this difficult to connect. And I just imagine my kids would just wake up every morning and memorize lots of Bible verses and get up in the morning and greet me with coffee. Good morning, Father. <laughs> nope. That image shattered a long time ago. 
And some parents unintentionally communicate to their kids that they care more about what they are accomplishing than who they're becoming. And when that happens, it's devastating to the identity of a child. Because it's wrapped up in what they do, and if they don't do the right things or accomplish the right amount, then it feels like, and maybe it's unintentional, and you never mean to communicate this, but it feels like your love is conditional. They don't know who they are anymore if they fall short. But we can't expect our kids to fit our picture. We've got to let them paint their own, picture, their own picture, and then we just join them in it. And when we do that, we retain influence and friendship. Here's the third area, a growing sense of accountability for themselves. A growing sense of accountability for their own lives. One of the end results we want with our kids is that we want them to be responsible for their own lives. So many parents spend so, so much time protecting their kids from life that they never prepare them for life. And so what are the tools that we need in order for kids to be responsible, functioning adults as a part of society, right? Well, are you helping them connect the dots between the decisions that they make today and the, the outcomes tomorrow? Are they able to see, oh, if I go down this path, it's going to lead me here, and that's not somewhere I want to be, so I don't think I'll go down that path. Are you walking them through and coaching them through? And one of the things I'm so thankful for that my parents did with me was they helped me understand I'm accountable for my actions. Not only am I accountable because every choice has consequences, but ultimately I'm accountable to God. My parents helped me understand that uh, not in a weird, like, God's going to get you kind of a way, but in a way that, hey, you've been entrusted with certain things. You've been entrusted with certain gifts and talents and resources and influence and abilities and opportunities. And anything that has been entrusted to you by God should be used. It wasn't given to you for your own benefit, but you're, you're accountable with what you do with what God's entrusted to you. That single idea has shaped me more than any other idea in my life. In Galatians chapter 6, again, Paul writes this, Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. We are each responsible for our own conduct. We're each responsible for our own conduct. We want to give our kids the tools to become responsible and recognize whatever God's entrusted to me, I'll give an account for what I did with what, he was, with what he's entrusted to me. And finally, here's the fourth area. We want our kids, we want to have influence in this in their lives, fully transferred dependence on God. Fully transferred dependence on God. What is the spiritual legacy of your family? What is that? Every family has a spiritual legacy. What will your family legacy be? What kind of legacy will your kids be a part of? That you were funny? That you were a great golfer? That you could belch the alphabet? Like what will they remember about? Are you working to ensure that they are part of something that matters more than all of the other stuff? Because how your kids view God will bleed its way into every aspect of their life. It will make its way into every aspect of their life, how they parent, how they handle their finances, their career choices, the way they live their life day by day. And so our goal as parents is to transfer their dependence on us when they're young and they're children, they're totally dependent on us. And as they grow into adulthood, we want them to transfer that dependence to God. In Ephesians 6, parents, bring your children up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. In Deuteronomy 6, we read this today, repeat God's commands again and again to your children. In Proverbs 22, it says, direct your children onto the right path, and when they're older, they will not leave it. We want to do everything we can as parents to let our kids know that even though they're dependent on us when they're younger, as they grow, they can fully transfer their trust to God. That He will always be there for them. That He will never leave them, never forsake them. And here's what I can tell you. You can't make a kid love God. You can't, you can't force a kid to love God. You can't force them to have faith. But you can influence them spiritually. And you can leave a legacy for them to follow. And so let me ask you, mom, dad, what are you doing to influence your kids in their spiritual life? What are you doing to, to help them understand that their trust in God is an important part of their life? You're the most significant spiritual influence in the lives of your kids. What are you doing to influence them spiritually? And this goes against what we think as culture, by the way, because here's what we think in our culture. If we want our kids to learn how to dance, take them to dance lessons, right? If we want our kids to learn how to swim, take them to swim lessons. If we want them to learn karate, we show them The Karate Kid from 1984, greatest movie of all time. And if we want them to grow spiritually, we drop them off at church, right? 
And then they'll grow spiritually. But the church is not the most important spiritual influence in the lives of kids. You are, as mom and dad, parents are because of the amount of time that you spend with them. So what's the spiritual rhythm in your home? What does that look like? How normal is God in your family? How normal is it for you to, to give and be generous and let your kids see that? How normal is it for you to talk about your faith, to talk about God, to love others, to serve others? Do they see that in you? Because if they don't see it in you, it's never, it's never going to become a part of the rhythm of their life. As a pastor, I always want my kids to understand, here's how we deal with situations. Here's how we treat people. Here's how we handle our money. Here's how we make choices. Here's what informs our choices. I uh, recently had a conversation with a mom who said, I just can't, I'm struggling so much. I just can't get my 14-year-old to go to church. And I was like, oh, well, where do they live? Because that's not an option in our house. When you turn, you know, when you're out of our house and you're not living in our house, that's just, that's just a rule for us. And I just think you as mom and dad have the biggest impact in the lives of your kids. And so what are you doing to show them, well, well listen, I just, uh, my kids don't like church. I don't want to force them to go because they might not like it. It sounds to me like they already don't like it. So I would say, bring them. Let them be in environments that can strengthen their faith. But ultimately, what do they see in you? Do you serve others? Do you forgive others when someone offends you? Do you uh, show them that you're generous with what God's entrusted to you? Do you show up in the lives of other people? Paint a picture of God that makes him worth following. It is our responsibility to prepare them for life and to retain influence in their life. And here's why. Later is longer. And so if you can retain influence in their life, then you can help them in these four areas. And here's what's so awesome about this. We have been invited to be a part of God's family. You and I are a part of, we, we are sons and daughters of God. In fact, Jesus said that to, to anybody who puts their trust in him, he gives them the right to be called children of God. And that's an incredible thing. And so here's what I want to encourage you with. You've been invited into God's family. And here's what that means. God will forgive your sins. And he will uh, make you his son and his daughter. He'll adopt you into his family. And he'll help you live your life. But here's the deal. All he asks is that you give him control of your life. That you turn the steering wheel over to him. And that you do your best to follow him with your life. Let him influence the way that you live. And if you've never said yes to that invitation before, I want to invite you to say yes. And you can do that right where you sit, right where you're watching as we close with this simple prayer. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times I've walked away from you. And I thank you that as a loving father, you never walk away. You continually pursue relationship with me. And I pray yes to the invitation. Yes to being your son, to being your daughter. And help me to live my life in such a way that I follow you. I put my trust in you. I live life your way. And God, we pray for each of us, parents, grandparents, uh, those of us that interact with kids on any level, give us the wisdom to know what to do with these things we've talked about today and then give us the courage to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.